So how do I grab your attention? In speech theory, it is often called the hook. What do I need to do or say to nab your attention and get you to pay attention for an extended period of time? Do I need to show you some cool little toy? Engage you with a cup of coffee? Or perhaps open up something that I just got in the mail? if I can figure out how to open it. Here we go. Very complex little box. And I got a new frame to mount my little action camera with. But that's not really what I'm here about today. Well, this is exactly what Luke does in Acts chapter two. He hooks us. How? By telling us a very dramatic story that is filled with all kinds of ideas, visual images, and amazing events. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 plus years, I've been teaching seminary at a lot of different institutions around the world. The goal of this channel is to help you read your Bible in a deeper and more informed manner. So if you find these videos informative and entertaining, please subscribe, give them a thumbs up, and hit that share button and let somebody else know about that. That would really help me out a great deal. Thanks. Just had to go get the camera and see how this works. Yeah, works great. Allows me to mount to tripods, GoPro type extensions, microphone, various accessories around it. Looks very useful. Pentecost is often called the birthday of the church. It marks the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles and the other followers of Jesus, which were in Jerusalem. They were observing the Jewish Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot. This was to be observed seven weeks plus one day after Passover. In the liturgical year, Pentecost marks the end of the season of Easter and moving into the season of what some call Pentecost or ordinary. The word Pentecost is a transliteration of the Greek word Pentecostos, or 50th. When used in the phrase, the day of, it specifically refers to the festival celebrated on the 50th day after Passover. We actually get this term from the Greek translation of the books of Tobit and 2 Maccabees, which are found in the Catholic Bibles, but Martin Luther and the other Protestant reformers decide not to include them in the Protestant Bible and chucked them out. They're in what we would call the Apocrypha. The Feast of Weeks is taken from Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, which reads, And from the day after the Sabbath, referring to Passover, from the day on which you bring the sheaf of the elevation offering, you shall count off seven weeks. They shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days, and then you shall present your offering of new grain to the Lord. And that's from the New Revised Standard Version. But it's not until we get into the books of Tobit and Maccabees that the Greek translation of the Old Testament uses the phrase, the day of Pentecost. Tobit 2.1 reads, Then during the reign of Esarhaddon, I returned home, and my wife Anna and my son Tobias were restored to me. At our festival of Pentecost, which is the sacred feast of weeks, a good dinner was prepared for me, and I reclined to eat. Originally, the Festival of Weeks was a celebration of the first harvest of the season. The Jewish believers were to bring a sheaf of barley as an offering that thanked God in anticipation of the coming harvest from their fields. By the time of the first century, however, it also celebrated and observed the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It was a time for annual renewal of the Mosaic Covenant within the Jewish communities. Pentecost takes place in Acts chapter 2. And when Luke records this, he stresses the when. He wants his readers to see one of three things or a combination of them when he stresses the when of Pentecost. First, that what happens in Acts chapter 2 is the first harvest of the church with much more to be anticipated like the festival of weeks in the Old Testament. Second, 
that the Spirit's coming parallels God's giving of the law on Mount Sinai to Israel. And third, there is both continuity between the emerging Christian faith and its Jewish roots. This took place during the Feast of Passover. But there is also discontinuity. Instead of the law being given, now the focus is on the descent and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 is a pivotal chapter in the New Testament. And once again, we need to go back to chapter 1, verse 8, to really understand what is taking place here. Acts 1.8 organizes and in a certain sense structures the book of Acts. In chapter 2, the disciples are gathered in Jerusalem the starting point for Jesus' instructions in 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. In verse 1, we are told that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version today. Note what Luke tells us. He really doesn't tell us where. Rather, he focuses on when. It's the day of Pentecost. 50 days after Passover when Jesus was in the grave. Where this story takes place could have been in a house in Jerusalem. It could refer back to the gathering of 120 believers referenced in chapter 1, verse 15, or they could be in the temple. We're not sure. He doesn't tell us where. He tells us when. Verses 2 through 4 read, And suddenly from heaven there came a great sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. In verses 2-4, through four, Luke tells us three signs or indications when the Holy Spirit came. Wind, fire, and inspired speech. Each one of these were historically considered within the Jewish community as a sign of God's divine presence. So let's take wind first. Wind as a sign of God's spirit is rooted linguistically in both the Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word pneuma, which is a translation of that. These words can mean either wind, breath, or spirit, depending upon the context. For example, in John 3.8, he uses the Greek word pneuma several times. The wind, pneuma, blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit, pneuma. So in this case, pneuma means both the wind and the Spirit. And Luke could be playing off that here as well. Why Luke emphasizes the sound of the blowing wind is difficult to say. But I think his main point is, is that it sounds like the blowing of a strong or violent wind, that it came from heaven and it filled the whole house. He's dramatically portraying the coming of God's presence or spirit into that situation. Fire. Fire, as a symbol of divine presence, is well known throughout the Jewish scriptures, especially in the stories of Moses. The burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The pillar of fire that guided Israel by night through the wilderness, Exodus 13. The consuming fire on Mount Sinai, chapter 24 of Exodus. And the fire that hovered over the tabernacle in the wilderness, Exodus 40. These are all great examples of God's presence being portrayed by fire. Fire is also used to speak about God's impending judgment. Thus, fire here could also serve as a sign of the future. Speech. In the Old Testament, prophetic utterances were regularly associated with the Spirit's coming upon someone for a special purpose. Perhaps the closest example or parallel to this passage is in the Old Testament when the Lord came down in a cloud and took some of the Spirit that rested on Moses and put it on the 70 elders of Israel, causing all of them to prophesy as well. Numbers chapter 11 verse 25. Sorry, got distracted. During the first century, there was a belief within Judaism that when the Messianic age would dawn, there would be a special outpouring of God's Spirit. Prophecy would once again flourish. Wind, fire, and speech create a very rich image of what God is doing when His Spirit comes upon them. 
It contains allusions to the Old Testament and it points forward to the Messianic age that is dawning. Luke loads this passage with theological and practical significance for the church. By stressing that the Spirit came to rest on each believer, Luke wants us to see that the relationship of the Spirit to the members of the body of Christ is not some abstract idea, but it's intimate, personal, and powerful. That believers are not just passive members of the church, but are called by God to participate in His plans and goals. And that just as Jesus' ministry was empowered by the Holy Spirit, so the church's ministry should be as well. How are we doing? We still got your attention? I hope you're noticing how Luke is using this story to capture our attention and to keep our attention so that we'll read through the entire book of Acts. So let's turn to verses 5 through 8. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? It bewildered those in Jerusalem. How could they have learned so many different languages? In verse 6, when he mentions the sound, that probably refers back to the sound of this violent wind in verse 2. And it conjures up the picture of people rushing to the scene to see what is going on. Now, just as a side note, and I'm going to throw this in completely for free, I don't know how many sermons I've heard where Acts chapter 2 is a reversal of the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Aside from the fact that there's languages in both stories, there's not much evidence in this text to see this as an interpretive nuance within Luke's story. I don't think Luke is referring back to the Tower of Babel. The crowd at Babel was confused by the multiplicity of languages, and they divided up. While at Pentecost, the crowd is confused because they're hearing their own language. I think what's taking place here is an example of how later readers can read two stories in light of each other, and it's called intertextuality. Even though there's no deliberate links between the two stories from the latter back to the earlier story, readers make these connections that their original authors may have never intended. And it makes for some interesting sermons, by the way, but we're not going to go there. Back to our text, verse 9. Verses 9 through 11. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Galatia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. So where are all these nations from? This list of nations has generated a lot of speculation. Why these 15 nations in particular? Especially since it includes nations that existed when Luke wrote, and some ancient ones as well. And if we go back to Acts 1.8 again, we can see how that structures and it's being played out in this story as well. The church begins with the disciples gathered in Jerusalem. Now, if we zoom out some, we can see that it's going to Judea. And then also to these other 14 nations as well on the day of Pentecost. Finally, it's going to end up in Rome that Luke mentions in the list here. Now that was the known world to them during that time. But we here in the 21st century, if we zoom out even more, can see how that list has spread and grown even greater. The gospel and the church has spread far beyond what Luke or anyone in the book of Acts could have imagined. One point we should especially take note of in this list of 15 nations, especially for the church here in America today, is that even though these people may have come from Jewish backgrounds, they are culturally and linguistically members of many different nations. Thus, from the moment of the church's inception, it was a diverse, multicultural body under Christ's leadership. All right, we got to keep moving through our story here. In verse 12, Luke writes, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. 
Once again, when Luke records, what does this mean, this question? Luke is using a question to introduce one of his main ideas. The miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit demonstrate the direction in which God's plan is now proceeding. God's divine plan is to embrace the entire world, and the church is his tool to accomplish that plan. Ancient writers sometimes described divine inspiration or presence in terms of drunkenness. Greeks believed in frenzied inspiration by the gods, and Philo, a Jewish writer thoroughly in touch and informed by Greek ideas, wrote of divine intoxication more than any other ancient writer. Thus, experiences of the transcendent, whether it was God-inspired in the Old Testament or what they would call demon or base spirit possession outside of it, was often described by people who observed it as sort of an intoxication. Even Paul in Ephesians 5.18 writes, Don't be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And he might have this story here in mind when he's writing that. In the book of Acts, some in the crowd attribute the disciples speaking in other language to drunkenness. This prepares the reader then for Peter's sermon, which is going to take place in verses 14 through 42, which we don't really have time to cover today. But in that sermon, Peter argues that speaking in tongues signifies Joel's prophecy that the end times have come. God is at work and the day of salvation has arrived. The decisive event of all this was the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Peter then closes with the counsel of repent, be baptized, and believe. And then finally, at the very end, Luke records us that many people were added to the church that day. The day of Pentecost doesn't just tell us what happened that day. It's loaded with theological significance for us today as well. We now stand in a new relationship to God based on the gift of the Holy Spirit to each believer. But this is not something primarily intended to make us feel good. As members of the church, we are called to participate in God's plan to take the message of Jesus to all the nations of the world as God's Spirit empowers and guides us. Well, I hope I was able to hook you and keep you engaged through this entire video. Acts chapter 2 is an incredible passage and it lays down challenges for us even to this day. It's not just history, but it's also provocation and a challenge as well. Stick with me again for next week's video. I hope I can hook you again for that one. And until then, I will leave you with the word of peace. Peace.